Good morning. Welcome to Generations Church Online and as well as you are here in our facility. We are just so glad that you're here with us today. Hey, we're going to do uh, something a little bit different this morning than our usual uh, morning expression of worship. Uh, today we will be worshiping in this place without singing. And I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, in a little while, but uh, today we are expressing our worship in other ways. So although I'm playing a little bit on my keyboard, I think it's because I feel comfortable back here doing this. Um, but I want to talk about worship a little bit. I want to talk about worshiping and, and how it really isn't difficult to worship without singing because it's not the action of singing that necessarily is worship. Although the Bible talks a whole bunch about it, and there are so many references about lifting up our voices to God, there are other things that we can do as well to, to worship Him. And the thing that we need to realize the most is it needs to be something that comes from our hearts and that our motivation needs to be in the right place. And I know there's a few people in here that can give me an amen, right? See, musical worship is a large aspect of worship, but it's also only one of the many ways that we can worship our Lord and Savior. See, there's various expressions of worship, but worship is deeper than the expression. Worship should be the reason and the leading factor of that expression. So it's the joy and, and the leading of our hearts and our minds to offer God something because of all he's done and all that he is in our lives. And you can give me another amen. See, even if the expression looks like worship, it may not be depending on the motivation that we have behind it. And I got to tell you, there have been times where I've, I've led worship and my motivation hasn't always been, been right. See, because things happen in our lives, things that distract us from serving God. As a matter of fact, my pump right now is yelling at me because Satan is trying to distract me from even this part of worship. Satan, my motivation is good today, buddy. Leave me alone. See, the best way to judge an act of worship is to look at the source of it rather than the appearance of it. Amen? See, Psalms 95, 1 says, Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. And Psalms 9, verses 1 and 2 says this. It says, I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart. I will recount all of your wonderful deeds. I will be glad and exult in you. I will sing praise to your name, O Most High. God, we worship you today in this place. See, the book of Psalms is this entire song book of worship songs. But the funny thing is, if you look at the book of Psalms, there is not a single actual written note of music in the whole book. See, it's only ideas about how we should express worship through songs. It gives us direction, but it doesn't tell us exactly what to sing or say or do. It says the book tells us to, though, shout and sing. Amen? To use instruments to use symbols, to use stringed instruments, to make a joyful noise. And that's how we worship. But there's not a single written note. You see, God wants us to create and sing to him an expression of worship that is relevant to our time, relevant to us today. See, he didn't want the book of Psalms to dictate every single note we were going to sing to him. He didn't want worship to be dictated down to every single expression that we make. He wanted worship to be our whole lives. Amen. See, he wanted it to be more than that. 
And as long as our motivation is true, then our worship will be true. First Chronicles 16 says this, Sing to the Lord all the earth, proclaim his salvation day after day, declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous deeds among all peoples. For great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. He is to be feared above all gods, for all the gods of the nations are idols. But the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and joy are in his dwelling place. Ascribe to the Lord all you families of nations. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord glory due to his name. Bring an offering and come before him. And it says this, worship the Lord the splendor of his holiness tremble before him all the earth see the world is firmly established it cannot be moved let the heavens rejoice let the earth be glad let them say among the nations the Lord reigns I like the verse or part of the verse where it says the world is firmly established it can't be moved. See, we can't move this world. We can't move the people that are against the Lord because they are firmly established. Satan does have a stronghold, but you see, we have a God that is bigger and better than that. We have a God that we can worship, and it doesn't have to be singing, and they can tell us, don't lift up your voices, but we can still worship him in this place. Amen? Amen. And so that's what we do this morning. We are going to worship him today in another way. Maybe not in the normal expression that we know, but in an, ex- in an expression that we should be doing anyway. Whole life worship. Every word we say, every move we make, everything we do should glorify and honor our God. See, I believe that the sounds of worship, whether it's hymns or or gospel or contemporary or with a rock band, is not as important as our motivation and the words, the lyrics that we use to worship Him. See, hymns are great. And classical music is beautiful. And gospel is uplifting. And rock, man, that drives me. But if our motivation isn't true and the words do not glorify God, it doesn't matter what the music is. And that's why God didn't put notes in the songs. Because we can use all those things to worship our Lord. See, we need to surrender to Him completely. And in doing that, then and only then can we live a whole life of worship a whole and complete life of worship. I want to read the lyrics to a song. I want to sing the song, but I'm not going to do that this morning. I'm going to read the lyrics to I Surrender All because I think that's what we need to be focusing on today is surrendering everything to Him laying down everything that we have before him, surrendering our lives to him, surrendering our worship to him, surrendering to him in every way possible so that we can have a full and complete life of worship in him. It says, all to Jesus, I surrender. All to Him I freely give. I will ever love and trust Him. In His presence daily live. And then from there it says, I surrender all. I surrender all. All to Thee, my blessed Savior. I surrender all. 
I surrender all. I surrender all. All to thee, my blessed Savior. I surrender all. Second verse says this, all to Jesus I surrender. Humbly at his feet I bow. Worldly pleasures all forsaken. Take me, Jesus. Take me now. I got to tell you, Jesus, you can take me anytime now. Because I surrender all. I surrender all. All to thee, my blessed Savior. I surrender all. All to Jesus I surrender. Make me Savior, holy thine. Let me feel the Holy Spirit. Truly know that thou art mine. All to Jesus I surrender. Lord, I give myself to thee. Fill me with thy love and power. Let thy blessing fall on me. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to thee, my blessed Savior. I surrender all. Lord, we just surrender to you right now, Father. Lord, whether we're in this building and in our living rooms or listening in our cars right now, Father God, we we surrender to you. Because they may be able to give us directive on what we can and cannot do, but they can never take away from us our Lord and Savior. So, Father God, we surrender to you right now. And we allow you to do the things that you need to do in us, Father God. We allow you, Father, to use Generations Church in a mighty way, Lord God. Because we are faithful to you. And our motivation is true. We surrender all to you today, Lord. And it's in the name of your most precious Son, our Savior, that we pray. And everybody said, Amen. Amen morning church I'm going to give this morning word and for you that don't know me my name is Hector Valdepena and it's coming out of the book of Proverbs verse 10 uh, excuse me chapter 10 verses 8 through 19 it's, it starts the heart of the wise will easily accept instruction but those who do talking are too busy to listen and learn They'll just keep stumbling ahead into the mess they created. The one who walks in integrity will experience fearless confidence in life, but the one who is devious will eventually be exposed. The troublemakers always has a clear or a clever plan and won't look into the eye, but the one who speaks correction honestly can be trusted to make peace. The teaching of the lovers of God are like living truth flowing from the foundation of life. But the words of the wicked hide an ulterior ulterior motive. Hatred keeps old quarrels alive, but love draws a veil over every insult and finds a way to make sin disappear. The words of wisdom flow from the one with true discernment but the heartless words of wisdom become like rods beating their backside. Wise men don't divulge all they know, but chattering fools blurb out words that bring them to the brink of ruin. A rich man's wealth becomes like a citadel of strength, for the poverty of the poor leaves them, leaves their security in shambles. The lovers of God earn their wages for a life of righteousness, but the wages of the wicked are squandered on the life of sin. 
If you readily receive in correction, you are walking on the path of life. But if you reject, rebuke, you're guaranteed to go astray. The one who hides his hatred while pretending to be your friend is nothing but a liar. But the one who slanders you behind your back proves that he's a fool never to be trusted. If you keep talking, it won't be long before you're saying something really wrong. Prove your wise from the very start. Just bite your tongue and be strong. Proverbs chapter 10, verses 8 through 19, the Passions Translation. Uh, awesome word. My favorite is those who keep talking. Something eventually is going to go wrong. Amen? Been there, done that. Uh, I'd like to do our uh, morning announcements uh, today. Uh, of course, uh, if you want to fill out a welcome card or put in a prayer request or do anything like that, you can do that at our favorite place, which is? That's right. Visit church.net. Extra brownie points over here. Thank you. All right. Visit church.net. You can give uh, online there. You can do your welcome card. You can do all kinds of things there. Also, you can go to paypal.me. Uh, slash Generations Church to give there as well. Of course, you can give uh, here at the church. You can either mail it to 6245 Palm Avenue, San Bernardino, California, 92407, or you can drop it by the church when somebody is here in the office. Um, consider purchasing a Stater's card. We talked about this last service, and I just think it's so important that we continue to uh, support our G Kids ministry. Some of you don't know, but uh, Lisa Jones, who is our, our our children's pastor, has been out and delivering things to all the kids in the uh, G Kids Rooted Ministry. As a matter of fact, my my daughter got a beach ball from her this last week. She really loves that beach ball. I do not. It did. Yeah, I did. It worked. So uh, thank you, Lisa, for delivering that and uh, making my daughter very happy and making me miserable. But that's okay. No, uh, it happens to hit everything in my house for some reason. I'm not sure why. But uh, she's doing a great job, and we need to continue to support that ministry. Even if the kids aren't here on on campus, we are still continuing to pray for them and, and serve them. And, and to do that, unfortunately, takes some money and although we do have ties and offerings here a lot of our ministries operate under funds that are donated uh, to them specifically so make sure you buy a stater's card because a percentage of that goes back to g kids and rooted and the path and all that they they get money from those things so make sure that you're buying stater cards if you need a stater's card you can either email us at get help or info, or one of those at generationschurchsb.com, and I'll make sure that that gets to the right place so that you can get one of those Seder cards, and we can deliver those to you. So you don't have to necessarily come here to pick it up. If you want a Seder's card, we can have that delivered to you. Helping Hands Ministry is reminding everyone to please bring their empty bottles and cans to the church. Bob is faithful. He opens up the bin outside there. Once you come in, if you've got a bag, you can actually just drop it off at the bins. You don't even have to drag it up to the doors, and Bob will put it right in the storage area and take care of that for you. The reason we're doing that is because uh, our Helping Hands ministry needs funds as well to be able to do the Thanksgiving baskets and Christmas baskets. Although we may be doing it a little bit differently this year, we are still doing it. None of those things are being stopped just because there's this going around us right now. Uh, continue to give your bottles and cans because that is the only uh, source of money they have right now unless you give a direct donation. Uh, and I don't know about you, but I seem to think every time I go and buy me a 12-pack of Diet Coke, they charge me like an extra $2 or something. I don't think it's that much, but that's what it seems like for that CRV. And then if you're just giving that back to Burtek or the city of San Bernardino or whoever your, your trash service is, don't. Don't do that. Save those cans. Bring them here to the church. And we will gladly take those down and get your CRV back for the ministry. So if you're giving your, your CRV away, why not give it to Generations Church? That's all I'm saying.
Uh, missions update, we have received $9,695 in mission support contributions. Thanks to all of you and for God's provision, we are making great progress to enable our missionaries to share the gospel in 46 countries around the world. Our mission's goal for 2020 is 15,000, but I say forget that. It's 20,000, Bruce. Let's call it 20,000 right now. We only need $10,000. We can do that. Get that money in. Keep giving it to missions. We can do that in the next six months. Continue to support and pray for our missionaries because like I keep saying every week, they are in the same situation we are in. Okay, there is, the COVID is not just in America. It's around the world, and that's where our missionaries are, and so they need to be supported as well. Uh, also, our Bible studies are active via Zoom meetings, men's Mondays at 6, renewed Tuesdays at 7, Impact is Wednesdays at 7, except for the next two weeks because I'm going on vacation. That's right. Come on, let's cheer. I'm going back to Missouri to spend some time on a farm staring at nothing. So no Bible study for Impact for the next two weeks. Uh, if you'd like to join one of our, our My Crew groups, make sure you email us at info at generationschurchsb.com. Or you can also email Keith at generationschurchsb.com and he will help you either get hooked up with a my crew group or help you to start your own my crew group and we have free zoom happening for any my crew that wants to start and use it so if you're interested in doing that we will allow you to use our zoom account to make that happen if you know anyone who needs prayer or help during these challenging times of course you can email us at all these here for prayer it's prayer at generations church sb.com other assistants get help at generations church sb.com i serve at generations church sb.com if you want to help us to deliver things or help people in need and of course all of our pastors pastor jim pastor jj mason key shane lisa if you want to get a hold of sally make sure you send an email to prayer at generations church sb.com because that goes directly to her and she will get that email that is a lot of information but i have one more thing for you I need to talk to you about why we're doing things differently today and what that means for us for the next few weeks in the future. I want to read for you uh, the new guidelines that were released on July 1st uh, for places of worship, which is what we are. And this is the important one. There were several changes, but this is the important one. It says, discontinue singing in rehearsals, services, etc., Chanting and other practices and performances where there is increased likelihood for transmission from contaminated exhaled droplets. Consider practicing these activities through alternative methods such as internet streaming that ensure individual congregation members perform these activities separately in their own homes. What this means for us here at Generations Church is we have two options. One, we can continue to hold live services with no singing and no worshiping with song. Or we can go back to streaming like we were before so that we can continue to worship loudly in our own homes and also wherever else you may be listening. After prayer and discussion, uh, your staff has decided that we are going to, starting next week, go back to online services. I don't know how long this will be. I don't know what the timeline is. Before, the state gave us 21 days, and they said they would then look at it again and change things that were needed to be changed. This time in the new directive, there is no timeline. It just says that it's for a period of time with no ending point. So we don't know when that will be. Uh, they say they will review it from time to time and let us know if there are any changes that need to be made. Now here at Generations Church, we have gone through great lengths to keep you safe. But one thing that happens when somebody is singing or speaking, those droplets are expelled a long distance. As a matter of fact, when I'm singing, it can go up to 28 feet. That means even if you're sitting in the back row, you may get my droplets. Now we've put plexiglass in front of all of our vocalists to try to stop that from happening. But it can still travel. As a matter of fact, the biggest worry is those droplets can remain in the air up to 30 minutes after they're released. And it could even be longer. They don't know for sure. They're still doing studies on that. So that is the concern. That's why the state is concerned, because there is a rise in cases. And that's not just because of testing. 
It's a percentage of increase of positives. Now, you're always going to get more positives when you test more, but you have to look at the percentage of positive compared to the testing numbers, and unfortunately, we're on the rise. We basically went from 2.4, which was our lowest, to 2.9, that we're back now above 5%. And that's concerning. And so that's why they've asked us to stop doing this because the concern is just like in restaurants and bars that we can get other people sick just by singing. So I know some of you are disappointed. I know that you wanted to continue with live services, but we've decided that I think it, that, that worship is so important that we've decided that we need to continue online for right now. When I get back from my vacation in a week, I'm only going to be gone one week, we will resubmit plans with the changes and things that we have done around here to see if we can somehow get approval with the things that we have done, whether or not that's appropriate. Because you guys continue to wear masks. During worship and singing, you wear masks. And we have plexiglass. That doesn't stop the droplets, by the way. It just prevents it from traveling farther. And so we'll see. We'll submit those plans and see what they say, whether or not we can continue on with live services. But for at least the next two weeks, for sure, we will be going back to online and not having live services. Those of you online, if you want to send a message over, I don't know, if it, Mason, are you on Facebook? Mason is watching Facebook, so you could actually message him right now with a question about this. Uh, I'm going to open it up to the people that are here in the facility. Jim had a great question. First service, he asked about whether this stuff was enough. And really, it isn't enough. They haven't made any directive on, if you do this, you can keep doing this. So we kind of have to wait and see. Like I said, we'll submit plans again and see if this is appropriate. Uh, right now, it's not looking like it's appropriate, but it doesn't mean that that can't change. Anybody else have any questions about what we're doing? Yes. Yes, so uh, Sally asked for those of you who can't hear if whether or not we're still broadcasting to the parking lot. We have never stopped. Uh, we are still on your radio in the parking lot. If you want to come here and park and be a part of our services at 88.7 FM, that is still going on. We did not stop that. So if you still don't want to come inside, you can still join us here at Generations Church in the parking lot. Uh, any other questions anybody might have that I can answer? No, see, you're a well-informed bunch of people, I can tell. You look very intelligent, and I appreciate that. Anything online, Mason? Not yet. Not yet. Okay. Well, if something comes up, we will try to answer that later, even if I have to go back and type it in. Uh, but for now, that's where we're at. God is continuing to, to protect us, continuing to keep us safe, and this is one of those ways that we can do it. So we're glad that you're here today, but for the next couple weeks, uh, remember, we're going back to online until we can somehow get uh, a, either approval or not uh, to continue with live services. Yes. Uh, this, the, the city does not have any separate mandates. The county, what they're doing is they're taking the state mandate and then making it their own. So San Bernardino County right now is lockstep basically with what the state is saying. So if the state gives us a directive, we have found that so far San Bernardino County has not done anything different than what the state is doing. Uh, other than, you know, having to occasionally impose uh, curfews and things during the, those uh, protests that were happening, there was nothing different that was happening than what the state was telling us. Good question, though. So right now we... In this county, San Bernardino County is pretty much adhering to the state guidelines. And right now, we are one of the counties that the state has put on notice that we are in trouble, <laughs> whatever that means. So they, they have closed down all restaurants and bars, uh, indoor eating, all those things have been closed down. And we're one of those 19 counties, I believe, where our numbers are so high that they feel they need to do that. So good question. Anybody else? Good. I think it's time to get into something else other than this news. And so uh, we are going to get into our message and we're going to begin that today with a video that we want you to watch.
Old Glory, Stars and Stripes, the Star Spangled Banner. From its inception, the American flag has been an important part of our nation's history. Surviving over 200 years, the flag has evolved physically and symbolically in times of crisis and achievement. The American flag is a symbol known worldwide. It has been an inspiration for holidays, songs, poems, books, artwork, and so much more. It's been used to show nationalism, rebellion, and everything in between. The flag is so important that its history tells the story of America itself. It symbolizes our freedom, our dignity, and the true meaning of being an American. It's been with us through our war times, our sad times, but also times of great joy and triumph. Hello, I'm Terry Ruggles. Our flag went through many changes before it became the flag that we all know and love today. Actually, it took a very long time, from June 14th of 1777 until July 4th of 1960. That flag has been shrouded in legend and mystery for many years. Did Betsy Ross truly design our first flag? Do the colors really stand for something significant? We'll explore these and other myths. Join me as we recount the history of our American flag. When we think of the American Revolution, we think of it in its final form, independence from Britain. In fact, it was a work in progress. It evolved from merely a protest into a full-blown revolution. It began as an attempt to redress grievances. In fact, it was an attempt to gain seats in Parliament so that for the first time, the colonists would be voting on laws that directly affected them. And the flag and its development reflected the various stages of that revolution. Let's take a look at some of the components that make up our current United States flag. We have what's known as the Canton or Blue Field, the stars, and of course, the stripes. So where did these design elements come from? The first use of alternating stripes of red and white to symbolize colonial unity on a flag was that of the Sons of Liberty. You know, the original Tea Party members, the guys who threw the chests of tea into Boston Harbor. The Sons of Liberty began protesting British governance of the colonies following the Stamp Act of 1765. They came up with a flag that looks similar to this only with less stripes. The pattern, however, was the same and it could be displayed either horizontally or vertically. This may have been the pattern that contributed to the stripes on our flag today. In 1775, at the beginning of the American Revolution, independence from the British Empire had not yet been declared. The Continental Congress was meeting in Philadelphia when a militia colonel from Virginia came forward in his uniform and volunteered to take command of the troops outside Boston, overlooking Boston Heights. That colonel was George Washington. And when he left Philadelphia, he took with him two flags. The Grand Union, or the Continental as it was called, was the first flag under which Continental soldiers fought. It uses the alternating red and white stripe pattern similar to the Sons of Liberty flag, only there are 13 stripes signifying the 13 colonies. However, you'll notice that instead of stars on a blue field, we have the King's Colors, also known as the Union Jack. This flag has a very significant meaning. It meant that we were fighting as 13 united colonies, but still loyal under British rule because remember, at this point, the colonies had not yet declared independence. Many people believe that the colors red, white, and blue were chosen because each had a specific meaning. Those meanings that have come down to us were ascribed years later. It is my personal belief that red, white, and blue were chosen simply because they were the king's colors, the established flag of each colony that flew over every colonial capital. The other flag that Washington took with him is known as the Washington's Headquarters flag. Look familiar? Well, as you can see, the entire field is blue. There are 13 stars arranged in a pattern known as the 32323 pattern. 
Five rows of alternating stars of three stars, two stars, three stars, two stars, three stars. However, you'll also notice that there are six pointed stars. A slight difference from the five pointed stars on the current flag. This would be the first use of the star pattern as an American flag, and today we can see a copy of this flag hanging in front of Washington's headquarters at Valley Forge. A year later, on July 4th, 1776, Congress declared its independence from Great Britain. And from that moment on, we were fighting for our independence. Yet the Continental Congress still did not design a new American flag. That flag came about on June 14th of 1777. That's when Congress passed the first of three major flag acts. The first act stated that the flag of the United States shall consist of 13 alternating stripes of red on white with 13 stars on a blue field forming a new constellation. But the flag act didn't specify whether those stripes were to be vertical or horizontal. Where was the blue field to be placed? What was the star pattern to be used? And how many points should each star have? Who designed the flag? In 1776, you couldn't go into a store and buy a flag off a rack. Back then, flags were made in one of two ways. Since most flags had a naval use, you could go to a ship's chandlery, that's a store that outfitted ships, and the chandler would contract with a sailmaker, or in many cases, an upholsterer to make the flag. An upholsterer back in colonial times had some different functions than we typically think of today because besides working on furniture, they also made flags and other military equipment. This is where the legend of Betsy Ross comes into play. We know that Betsy Ross was an upholsterer. We know she made flags for the Pennsylvania Navy and then made flags for the New American Republic. What we don't know is whether or not she designed the first American flag. We don't know whether she manufactured it. All of this is surrounded in mystery and remains so to this day. In 1870, Betsy Ross's grandson, William Canby, was addressing the Historical Society of Philadelphia, and he said that his grandmother told him that she met with George Washington and others and that she designed the flag. But did she designed it, or was it Francis Hopkinson? Francis Hopkinson was a signer of the Declaration of Independence from the state of New Jersey. The only direct evidence that we have as to who designed the American flag was the bill that Hopkinson submitted to Congress. In it, he asked for a quarter cask of public wine. Congress refused to pay the bill and stated, in essence, that since he was not the only person involved in the design of the flag, it would be unfair to just pay him. So to this day, that bill remains unpaid. Regardless of these facts, the legend lives on, and the first flag of the Revolutionary period is referred to as the Betsy Ross flag. The pattern of stars on a blue field is known by three names, the Betsy Ross pattern, the Philadelphia pattern, or the single wreath pattern. The blue field on the flag also goes by three names, the field, the union, or the canton. During this period, and up until 1912, Congress did not set the specifics of where the field would be, or what the star pattern should look like, or how many points the stars would have. And so stars could be arranged in any manner that a flag maker would choose. When Congress put together the components of the flag, they used the 13 alternating stripes of red and white as portrayed in the Sons of Liberty flag. They also blended with that Washington's headquarters flag, the blue field on which there were 13 stars. In fact, many people believe that the alternating pattern of 32323, which is on Washington's flag, was the flag pattern that Francis Hopkinson submitted as his design. But again, since there is no description of his flag, there is no picture of his flag, there is no sketch of his flag, we just do not know. This pattern is known as the cowpens pattern. Another well-known flag during this time was the Easton flag. Interesting design, right? But remember, Congress did not specify where all the elements should be placed. 
After the Revolutionary War ended, our country wrote a new constitution. We elected George Washington president, and in 1792, we brought in two new states, Vermont and Kentucky. And this brings up the question, what do we do now with the flag? Because the original flag act called for 13 stripes and 13 stars to represent the 13 colonies, what to do to signify the adding of two new states to the Union? At this time, Congress passed the second flag act, and it stated that from now on, we would add one stripe and one star for each new state. The best known of the 15 stars and stripes flag is the flag called the Star Spangled Banner. It is the flag that flew over Fort McHenry and inspired Francis Scott Key to write our national anthem. After the War of 1812, we were adding more states again. And as we incorporated more stars and stripes into the design, our flag was starting to look, well, a, a little funny. So in 1812, Congress passed the third of the three major flag acts. It stated that the design was to go back to the original configuration of 13 alternating stripes of red on white, representing 13 original colonies, but that we would add one star for each new state. However, once again, it did not specify what pattern the stars should be arranged in or the amount of points that each star was to have. So we had many variations of a flag designed during that time. Finally, in 1912, President Taft established the pattern of stars that we know today. In President Taft's 1912 edict, he finally established the star pattern to be used on American flags. He required three things. First, all stars now had to be five-pointed. You could no longer use four, six, eight-pointed stars. Secondly, the stars had to be in horizontal rows. And third, no longer was it permissible to have the top star point moved. It had to be straight up and down. Our flag is an inspiring symbol that unites us all as American citizens. The unique history of the American flag follows our unique history as a country and reminds us of the triumphant beginning of the United States. The 13 stripes, a symbol of the first 13 colonies. The stars, a symbol of our country's 50 United States. And as our country grew and developed, so did our flag. It has followed the fate of our nation itself, and in the future, our flag could change again. Today, our flag remains a vibrant symbol of American principles of democracy and justice and freedom. And of course, the everlasting memory of those who sacrificed their lives defending intrinsic principles of the United States of America. Over 200 years ago, the Second Continental Congress officially made the Stars and Stripes the symbol of America, going so far as to declare that the 13 stars gracing the original flag represented a new constellation with the ideal that America embodied a bright new hope and light for mankind. Today, our flag continues to carry the inspirational and fundamental convictions of our great nation and will continue to do so for many years to come. I want to uh, give my disclaimer before I go uh, any further. Uh, you're probably saying, what in the world does the flag have to do with the blood of Jesus Christ? Well, I, I just want you to know that there's a huge connection here, and uh, I'm going to explain it best I can over the next several moments. But, uh, but forgive me if you're at a loss saying, you know, wait a minute, I, I went to church. I want to hear about healing and salvation. Uh, I can tell you some stories afterwards that'll satisfy you, maybe. Uh, what, what I did want to do is I wanted to present uh, some information about the flag of the United States of America, what it represents and what it does, because how many of you know that we're living in a culture today that wants us to do away with the flag of the United States of America? They're, they've already uh, pulled down most of the statues of the great men and women of, of the past and, and uh, who've had a huge impact on uh, our lives. So, so there's an underfoot, of, an undercurrent of, of a decisive movement that wants to stop us from worshiping the flag. 
We don't worship it, we admire it, we trust it, we, we invest in it. And so because of who we are, we touch our flag and that gives our flag the, the ability to say, I belong to these people, the flag can say back to, or the people can say back to the flag, you belong to us. And so we're going to spend a few minutes talking about a couple of the interesting things that uh, pertain to Jesus Christ and, 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 the, and the flag of the United States of America. I, I, I'm going to trust for a few moments that you're as excited and about as interested in this as I am. When I saw the idea just a few days ago, I thought, in the culture that we're facing right now today, this is a good word to people. And, and so uh, I, I, I'm going to try to not take sides, but I don't know how I can not take sides. So I probably will take sides. So uh, uh, forgive me in advance. It's, uh, you know, if you have an opposite point of view, hallelujah, amen, that's fine. Uh, but uh, I, I probably will express my point of view. Here's a little bit of the history of the American flag. On June the 14th, 1777, the Continental Congress passed an act establishing an official flag for the new nation. The resolution stated, resolved that the flag of the United States be 13 stripes alternating red and white that the union be uh, 13 stars while in a blue background. And on August the 3rd, 1949, President Harry Truman officially declared June the 14th as the flag day. And we celebrate it. I don't know what we do with Flag Day anymore as I think about it. But we do know that who Jesus is and what the flag represents to us is a very important uh, thing. Here's another interesting thing. It has, the, the flag has survived battles, inspired songs, and evolved in response to the growth of the country it represents. It's almost as if the flag has a life of its own. It's almost like it, it uh, has separated itself. And one of the things that I want you to walk away with over the next several minutes is that the flag of the United States of America represents freedom that everywhere that flag is, that's a nation under freedom. And that's why if you pay attention to things of this nature, we don't only fight battles on our ground. We send troops to foreign countries so that that country can live a life of, of freedom. And our blood has been spilled on those battlefields and their representative that this is a place where freedom where freedom dwells and it's an incredible thing that not only will we fight a battle here we'll fight them around the world and we you know if you stop and think about it lots of lots of countries have had soldiers, United States soldiers, on, on their premise for a long time because we're winning wars and we're changing people's lives. America's flag, American flag is unknown. Some historians believe it was designed by New Jersey Congressman Francis Hopkins and sewn by Philadelphia's seamstress Betsy Ross. How many of you can remember back to maybe when you were in the sixth or seventh grade, somewhere around that time frame, 
and, and you had a history lesson. I remember so clearly, Betsy Ross was the maker of the flag. That was the attitude way back there, what we saw on the screen just a few moments ago. It's questionable whether it was uh, Betsy or this other fellow, uh, but they collaborated and, and we have a flag and the flag represents every place it goes. That flag represents freedom for our lives. But we can go to bed at night because we have someone standing on the wall, protecting us, giving us freedom to worship the way we want to, to go where we want to go, to be who we want to be. See, that's the, the, the power of the, of the flag of the United States of America. One of its nicknames is uh, Old Glory. Maybe you've said it that way yourself. Most of us have. The name Old Glory was given to a large 10 by 17 feet flag by the owner, William Driver, a sea captain from Massachusetts. And Driver's flag is said to have survived multiple attempts to deface it during the Civil War. Driver was able to fly his flag over the Tennessee uh, State House once the, floor, the, the war ended. And that had to be such a thrilling moment for him. His flag, his freedom, and made a difference that the battle was won and who America became on the tail of that has changed history because of men and women who have stood and made a difference in our lives. Between 1777 and 1960, Congress passed several acts that changed the shape, design, and arrangement of the flag and allowed stars and stripes to be added to reflect the admission of each new state. Can you imagine what, what it would be like if we had been adults even back here to this one I just read, that we were a part of a, a like territory of becoming a, an American. And, and so those uh, positions were, were given in, in the process that a, that a country went through and in our age, or maybe I should say my age, Sally's age, <laughs> some of your ages, the, it, it was a historic, though I don't remember too much about when Arizona, for example, uh, came aboard. Uh, I remember Alaska and uh, Hawaii. Those were the ones that made me all of a sudden say, whoa, that state now can have its protection from the United States. It can be one of the, the addresses that the United States of America resides here and there is freedom in this place. And, and so we, we, we see that, and, and I remember watching that and thought how amazing that was, and how amazing it was that they, they answered all the questions, they made all the commitments, and they became uh, citizens of the United States of America. Today, the flag consists of 13 horizontal stripes, seven red alternating with six white. The stripes represent the original 13 colonies, and the stars represent the 50 states of the Union, and all of them free. All of them had a commitment to represent their position well and to have the back of one another. 
so that any time there was a war, you know, uh, Texas can't, could never say, eh, I'm not into it today, I'm not gonna go. They can't do that. When there was the call, there was the obedience, and there was the difference that made in foreign countries' lives as we have changed, literally changed the world. Now, just a few earlier today, I, I would have uh, maybe uh, challenged, this is a side note, the challenge, the, uh, the spittle thing, but I just did a drop there, and uh, so I, 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 I squashed it out, and, and uh, it's no longer dangerous. <laughs> Maybe it's more dangerous than ever, I don't know. <laughs> the flag of the United States of America, one of the things that uh, is so inspirational to me, I, I, I get emotional about stuff like this because I know that those who came before me made a decision to go to war so I could have freedom. And when I went to war, I was saying to the generation behind me, you have freedom because I and others like me are going to war. The privilege of representing people is so incredible. And one of the, the, there's a couple of times, how, how many of you ever been at a, a baseball game or a, a college football game and, uh, and you stand just before the game starts and you do the, the uh, the, the, the national song, Oh Say Can You See, and what great lyrics uh, they are. And, and, and while you're standing, while you're singing that song in, in key places, suddenly there's six jet planes, the roar of which it makes it hard to hear for a minute that these planes, piloted by the best flyers around, and they said, we're on the job. We're representing you. We're gonna make a difference. And that's what the United States is all about. We live in this culture now, and the court culture is pressing us hard to abandon what we've known for 200 years and just be a regular place. Let be what be, and whatever people want to do, let them be. And so there, there are people who want us to uh, say no more national anthem or they'll write another one that has nothing to do with what over 200 years of history would teach us to do. And I, for one, want to say, no way. I'm not going to allow that to happen on my watch. You see, we, we have to represent that, and we have to be the voice that brings change. As you know, we got a couple of groups running across the United States, and they're saying all kinds of things, and they're making all kinds of demands. And, and to my thinking, I think that we've given in too much already. I, I would have said at the back, your mama gets that, not you. You know, the, we're not going to uh, play around with this thing. We're talking about the United States of America. If you like what you see here, stay. If you don't, thank you for coming. Go back to Nowheresville around the world somewhere. You see, that I don't know. That's probably an impossibility. But I, if, I, if I were a general in the Army, I'd say, okay, let's go, guys. Well, maybe I wouldn't, but I, I would want to. 
But see, we, we, we're in the business. America's in the business of protecting people who need help. And there are those who want to take that away from us. We can't let it happen. We got to do what we need to do so that freedom rings out and it makes a difference in people's lives. The National Museum of American History has undertaken a long-term preservation project of the flag that stood the test of that McHenry uh, war vessels. The flag now is stored. They're, they're trying to re keep this thing from falling apart. I guess after a long time it'll happen. But the flag now is, stone, is stored at a 10 degree angle in a special low oxygen filtered light chamber and is periodically examined as a microscopic uh, level of deterioration. So uh, we're, we're talking about history. We're talking about what represents us, and that's what that does. There are, here, here's a few uh, of the locations where the United States flag is flown 24 hours a day by either presidential proclamation or by by laws. The, the first one is Fort McHenry in Baltimore. The, the second one is the United States Marine Corps Memorial, Imo uh, Jima. The next one is on the green at the town of Lexington, Massachusetts. How many of you have been in New England and you've seen some of these sites and some of these places? You, you, you have to go. Uh, we, we've been there a couple of times. Last time I, I, I walked about a five mile Freedom Trail uh, with, with those main characters that uh, spoke into uh, our freedom and our liberty. The White House keeps the the flag going 24-7. The United States Customs does the same. Uh, Fort, uh, Fort, uh, Fort, uh, yeah, I'll get it. <laughs> One of these guys in Valley Forge, Pennsylvania. Okay, there we go. That's as close as I can get to that one. After a British, uh, I, I told the first service that I highlighted some of this in green. And uh, that was a mistake. It's too hard to, to read. But uh, I, d I do want to tell you that uh, the flag of the United States of America uh, is, in fact, in, in 1909, Robert Peary placed an American flag sewn by his wife at the North Pole. And he left a... a it left pieces of another flag along the way. It is only, this is the only time a person has been honored for cutting the flag. In 1963, Barry Bishop placed the American flag on the Mount Everett. In July of 1969, the American flag was flown in space when uh, when Neil Armstrong placed uh, it on the moon, flags were planted on the lunar surface on each of the six times that our spaceship landed on, on Mars or the moon or wherever it is. The, 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 the first time the American flag was flown overseas on a foreign fort, was in Li Liberia over Fort Benin on the shores of Tripoli in 1805. You see, the 
wherever Americans go, the flag goes. The flag represents freedom, and we need to protect that freedom. We need to make a difference in uh, our lives and the lives of this world that we live in. You can uh, Google this stuff. Uh, it's, it's readily available. But let me just uh, say this one. The United States flag should never be dipped toward anybody or object, nor shall the flag ever touch anything underneath it. Have you remembered in any of your, your training or talks about the flag of the United States of America that is not supposed to touch the ground? It never should touch the ground. And so that's one of the uh, cares and concerns that we have when we handle the flag. We make sure that we don't uh, defile it by letting it touch the ground. And so I just want to uh, include or, or conclude with, with this uh, thought. We're, we're either going to grow as a nation and have a wider span of influence around the world than ever before, or we're going to be nondescript, out of business, no difference we can make in anyone's life. And it's really not our responsibility, but you and I have a responsible act in this, that we, we need to saddle up and we need to uh, cheer on our, our military forces and when they're going somewhere, to make the commitment to pray for them and to cover them with the presence of the Almighty God so that they can have the assurance that they're not just out there and no one cares. They're out there, the world cares, and they're going to make a difference. And so I just uh, want to encourage you, don't, don't be passive, be assertive. Make a difference. Let me pray for you. Father, we stand before you and we thank you Lord that you have given us not that the flag saves anybody but the, the flag symbolizes that America is a country that is in favor of its inhabitants and so Lord we just present every American. We, in fact, Lord, we present every, every nation that exists somewhere around the world. And most of those places have t felt the touch of your hand. And Lord, I'm going to ask that you would continue to give America a passion for freedom so that nations around the globe will experience freedom along with us. So, Lord, we thank you for who you are, and we thank you for the transformation that you've done in our lives, and we give you praise now in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, this is a time where we uh, take tithes and offerings, and for today here in service, we just ask that you would place your envelopes and checks in the basket in the back. Again, if you're uh, watching us online, we invite you to go to visitchurch.net. Uh, you can give there, or you can go to paypal.me slash generationschurch as well. Uh, we are just so blessed by the fact that you continue to give, allowing us to continue to serve God in the Verdamont area and the city of San Bernardino, which we want to continue to do. Thank you again for all of your uh, thoughts and prayers as we continue to navigate this chaos. Uh, we will be with you again this next week. Just want you to know that we love you, and we will see you online. And make sure you practice safe social distancing and be healthy and safe this week. We love you. Thank you so much for joining us today. Have a great day. And Lord God, we just ask that you would bless these people. Lord, bless this place. Bless Generations Church. And we thank you, Lord, for all that you do for us, continue to use us, Lord, 
to expand your kingdom. We love you in your name we pray. Amen. Be socially distanced on the way out. <laughs>